Uh, good morning, um, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome once again to our Zoom monthly webinar series. Uh, today we will be discussing the gender agenda in standardization uh, with the main focus on gender dimension of standards and the mainstreaming gender in the development and implementation of standards why it matters. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Mojen Sengimana, uh, Secretary General of African Organization for Standardization. Uh, we will be having uh, so many speakers. I will present them as uh, we go on. But uh, looking at uh, this topic, uh, actually we are discussing this topic because when you look at the Agenda 2063, uh, Agenda 2063 of the African Union, uh, you look at the aspiration number three, where we, Africa governance, good governance, democracy, respect of human rights, justice and the rules of law, culture, practices, universal principle on human rights and gender equality is mentioned. Then you look at uh, aspiration number six of, for the agenda, Africa Agenda 2063, where we, Africa development is, should be people-driven and enriching the potential of its women and youth and has full gender equality in all spheres. Then this is the Africa Agenda 2063. When you look at the SDGs, the 2030, mainly on goal number five, gender equality, uh, where the UN seeks to end all forms of discrimination against all women and girls everywhere, and actually facilitate the adoption and the strengthening of sound policies and enforceable legislation. Uh, we, thought it's very important that we start discussing the gender mainstreaming. The main objective of uh, this um, uh, webinar is uh, to look at uh, how the policy issues uh, should be uh, also discussed uh, under the, the, the standard organization development stakeholders. Uh, how can we contribute to gender equitable world uh, when you look at the AOU? How can we contribute uh, to the AFCFTA, which is the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement? It's very important that the gender uh, responsive uh, standards are part of this journey. And uh, how can we do that is to make sure that standardization, uh, while we are developing standard, while they are regulatory coming from standards, uh, all these uh, uh, gender uh, mainstreaming is taken care of. This is very important. It's what we are embarking on. Uh, we all welcome you to this webinar. Uh, and uh, our first speaker today uh, will be Dr. Eve Gadzikwa, uh, who is uh, uh, the Director General of the Standard Association of Zimbabwe since 2008. Uh, actually, uh, she has also been the ARZO president, is the past immediate ARZO president uh, from 2016. Uh, to 2019. Uh, Dr. Eve Gazikwa is also in charge of for the gender, uh, is a championing the gender in Africa and the Arab states region. Uh, Dr. Eve Gazikwa, you are most welcome. Uh, you can share your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much and a very good day to you, Secretary General and participants. Thank you for the invitation. I will go straight to, to share my, my screen.
please confirm that you have seen my presentation, Secretary yes. General. Yes, we are seeing your presentation. Thank you. Okay. All right, a very good day to you all. Uh, once more, I would like to say good afternoon and um, to thank ASO for the kind invitation to participate in the ASO monthly webinar series and also the opportunity to share ISO's perspective on gender dimension of standards in my capacity as uh, the ISO council member and also gender champion for Africa and Arab states. So, um, I've just given very little time, five minutes actually, to, to cover this important topic, but I hope I can do justice uh, in, in the short time that I've been given. So um, let me just try and put it in so that I can see the presentation properly. Right, so uh, in my brief uh, presentation. You can, uh, yeah, you can do presentation mode. All right, let me try and put it in presentation. Yes, down on the right, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm having challenges with my screen. Can I ask uh, Secretariat to perhaps put it in slideshow for me? I'm having some challenges from this end, SG. Okay, we can we can share and you will tell us to do next, next. Uh, yes, that's right. Share. Okay, share screen. Right, is it uh, clear for everyone on the screen? Yes, yes now, now it's clear, yeah. All right, so um, this very brief uh, presentation is just going to cover um, uh, three aspects. Uh, maybe let's go to the first slide. And uh, let me uh, apologize in advance for my hoarse voice. This is my normal voice. I'm just recovering from a bad cold. So um, the issue of why gender, I think um, SG, you have covered this in your opening remarks where you were mentioning uh, quite a number of, you know, the guiding principles uh, under you know, uh, the UN, uh, the African Union, ETC, which are all pointing towards the need for us to be alive to the issue of gender equality. So I think uh, as ISO, ISO has also adopted the same, um, I would say the same thinking to say, how can standards actually play a part towards making sure that gender equality is achieved in, in the standards development process. Next slide. It's just a few slides that I'll go through. So the first uh, slide that I'm going to talk to is gender equality and the business case. I think if you look at this one, I'm not gonna attempt to read all of this. I think the main issue really here is to identify the fact that one in five SMEs are owned by women. Um, you know, this is uh, you know, it's, it's research that has been done. And in the UK, it's also been seen that there's quite a lot of representation uh, in terms of uh, female-owned businesses, 1.2 million new enterprises in the UK, meaning that the potential loss of income uh, is 7.5% uh, of global GDP. Uh, that's research that was done by OECD. I think all indications are pointing towards the need for um, there to be more gender mainstreaming in terms of businesses. This is in terms of business. So how does this uh, tie up with standards development? Go to the next slide, please. Next slide. Seems like the slides are not moving.
Next slide, Dan. Okay, I would just have to um, use my slides from this end so that we don't lose time. So let's talk about the power of standards in gender equality. I'm sure you're gonna get the presentations at the end. So um, looking at the perspective of ISO and how ISO is tackling this whole issue of standards um, in terms of gender mainstreaming, standards can promote gender equality and women empowerment. And to date, ISO has 173 ISO standards which contribute or have the potential to contribute to the SDG 5. And you know, there's a list here of some of the standards. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of standards, may I add, but to say already there has been an appreciation of the need for standards to, to actually speak to agenda mainstreaming. Um, and this is an ongoing discussion and an ongoing effort by ISO. And in fact, our next slide, there has been a paper that has been now developed. The first ISO deliverable on women's entrepreneurship has developed the first um, international workshop agreement, 34-2021, women entrepreneurship. Again, this is a recognition of the effort that ISO is making um, towards ensuring that there is a concerted effort towards gender mainstreaming in the standard development process. So next slide, standards can promote gender equality and women empowerment. There are quite a few examples which I am happy to share with you. Iceland, for instance, has the equal pay management system. Chile has uh, the gender equality and conciliation management system. South Africa, the personal protective equipment for women in mining. UK, valuing um, you know, people through diversity and inclusion code of practice for organizations. Costa Rica has also got a management system for gender equality in the workplace and Canada, care inclusive and accommodating organizations. These are just a few of the examples um, that we would like to, to you know, share with you today in terms of some of the national initiatives that have, have, been, have been done. So there is a, a video which you will be able to look at uh, at your own time. We, we probably don't have the time to look at it now, but it's shared on, on, on the slide there. Uh, I'm now on the slide that reads, applying a gender lens to ISO standards. So looking at this, um, the whole uh, discussion around gender mainstreaming of standards and the approach that ISO has taken, ISO standard represents globally recognized guidelines and um, the aspiration of ISO, of course, is to make an impact in terms of all aspects of daily life and also looking at protection of the health of the planet and people and facilitating trade and innovation, as well as working with all businesses, large and small. And as we know in Africa, we do have a lot of small, uh, you know, SMEs type uh, businesses, which also need to have gender mainstreaming in their uh, you know, uh, as part of the development. So how can standards actually um, promote gender equality? I think the starting point is this discussion that we're having today. The need to raise awareness of standards in support of gender equality. The need to increase women's participation in standardization. I always joke that women, uh, we actually, um, uh, you know, uh, an endangered species, as, as it were. We need more women to be championing the, you know, the development of, of standards and mainstreaming standards in, in their work. And mainstreaming gender in the standard development process itself, and developing standards to support gender equality. So there is a, um, a plan that I'd like to share with you that, uh, has, uh, that um, ISO has come up with. And the main purpose of the ISO, um, you know, ISO plan, gender action plan for ISO is to deepen the understanding of gender representation in ISO work and to assess the gender impl uh, implications of standards and to ensure that ISO work and activities include gender perspectives. In a nutshell, um, there are 
five priority areas. The first one is ISO has already done quite a lot of work in terms of collecting data on gender representation. Um, uh, the other second priority area is the collection of case studies um, and creating a repository of the National Standards Body Gender Action Plans. And also now the next one is the priority area three, which is improving the understanding of the possible gender implications. This is the work that ISO is doing. And the number four priority area is improving the understanding and knowledge of standards in support of gender equality. And the last priority area is ISO's policy on gender, defining the long-term objectives. So ISO actually has a long-term objective. Uh, it's not a one-day affair um, that is going to deliver the, you know, the end result of what we want to see. Just a quick uh, survey. I know I've run out of time. But just to show you what um, the picture looks like, when you look at uh, the CEO survey that was done by ISO, when you look at male CEOs vis-a-vis um, -vis female CEOs, you see the picture looks like this. The pie chart is in favor of um, the male at 73%, with only 25% being female. Looking at um, the participation at ISO's technical work um, is twice the, the female participation. When you look at the male participation, it's 68%, and females only constitute 31%. And here, this is a very interesting slide showing uh, the experts, the survey that was done by ISO, showing the chairs, the conveners, the committee members, and the experts. Again, 70% um, in terms of chairs, uh, male, 74%. Are male conveners, 54% um, committee uh, managers and experts, 69% are male. So clearly you can see that um, there is a gap uh, in terms of um, the representation of women, uh, you know, when you look at the comparison with the men. So as I come to the end of my presentation, I saw gender focal uh, point there's a network that has been formed by ISO. And this network is to really bring together all these um, you know, uh, interested stakeholders. And this platform is for members to share knowledge and best practice in terms of what would, uh, you know, would be best practice uh, to promote uh, gender mainstreaming of standards. 66%, uh, 66 participants, um, uh, men and 57% females. And you look at the regional representation, you can see that on the Africa and Arab states, which I represent, we have 13 participants from the 12 NSBs out of the 51. Americas, the Caribbeans, 23 uh, from 14 NSBs and the Asia Pacific, 17. And we also have the Europe and Central Africa, 13 from the eight NSBs. So I think, um, I think in a nutshell, this is what I had to share today. I think the message is loud and clear that the issue of gender mainstreaming is extremely important. If we are going to see, um, you know, it, uh, standards being more uh, represented in terms of their development, it really starts from the beginning, not at the end. It starts from the beginning in terms of the production of those standards, who is producing the standards and who is championing the development of standards will make a huge impact in terms of gender mainstreaming. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, I am intrigued. I am intrigued to ask you. I, I saw that uh, on the continent, South Africa, you gave an example that uh, uh, the gender mainstreaming in the standard uh, for protective equipment. Uh, maybe to those who don't understand more, well, what was the issue there well, well, to, to, to have specifically the, the, the protective equipment, uh, a component of gender? Do you know in a, why, why they revised those standards? Well, um, 
in the case of South Africa, uh, I could be wrong, but what I suspect is the, the case really, uh, SG, is if you look at the, the, the standards that are being developed, um, uh, when you look at the occupational health and safety type of standards in relation to those ones, women um, who are hurt at the workplace, uh, they actually respond differently in terms of, you know, how they recover from these, um, you know, occupational health and safety issues. So it's very important that these issues are actually captured in the standards, because if a standard is developed in such a way that it doesn't actually address the female di dimension, it means that even um, the, the application of these standards becomes uh, problematic. So I think that was the thinking behind making those amendments so that they speak to the realities on the, gr on the ground in terms of how women actually are affected by these standards as they are implementing them. Thank you. You, you make me think about the seat belts for a, a pregnant lady as an example. May, maybe there are many, many other things that we, we can talk about. You, you have shown the, 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 uh, the levels of the chairs, the, the conveners, which really is um, at 30 percent in technical committees, even on the sea or everywhere is 25 percent. <laughs> Do you think um, what would be the impact on continuing in uh, a, a blind, um, in a gender blind standardization way? What would be the impact in the future on our standard work? Yeah, uh, thanks, SG. I mean, really and truly, I mean, I always talk about this, but it's actually a serious issue. I think if we had to continue the way we are continuing, I mean, I was just looking at even the spread with the CEOs. Uh, you know, we've got our chat platform with all the CEOs. Uh, I tend to <laughs> stick out like a sore thumb. If we continue that way, it essentially means that we are limiting the participation of women to be effective uh, in terms of their contribution to um, you know, standards that affect them. These are standards that affect them. We always say that standards, we should not be standards takers or standards makers. But if we continue without you know, putting these um, blinkers blindly and you know, continue to produce our standards uh, as though uh, the gender dimension is not important, it is just as important as transparency, openness, and the other principles that we uphold as the standardizers. So I think the issue of gender is one uh, dimension which is not spoken about a lot, but it's something that we really should be alive to now as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Eve, for your presentation and your insight. I, I would like to go to uh, our next presenter, who is Ray. Uh, Ray Walsh. Um, uh, uh, Ray. <coughs> Where... Ray, you, you have uh, a big expertise uh, in um, uh, on gender issues. Uh, Ray is a director since 2020 of the EU Observatory for IST Standards, uh, which steers the data acquisition phase of the new standard watch. Uh, by coordinating a detailed standard landscape and ecosystem analysis for 5G cloud data technology. And uh, Ray is uh, a, a lead of uh, UNEC uh, on gender responsive standard initiative expert group. Uh, Ray, with your expertise, uh, I, I would like to, you to talk about the, this mainstreaming gender and standardization, uh, linking to the initiative that you have as UNECA on a global gender responsive standard initiative. Uh, what is about that initiative? What, what are the program uh, in, in that initiative? And um, uh, maybe you can also touch on the impact. Yeah. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Um, it's been a, a pleasure to be uh, invited here to, to speak at, at, at your sessions here. And yeah, so to introduce myself, um, my name is, is Ray Walsh and 
I'm from Dublin City in, in, in Ireland. Um, I work with Dublin City University as part of the, the number of research organizations here. And a, a lot of my time is spent now in um, uh, working on standards related activities in, in areas like the European Commission, the United Nations and the World, World Economic Forum. So in, in relation to specifically the gender responsive standards initiative from, uh, on, uh, from UNES, I mean, effectively what we're, what we're trying to address is that a standards development organizations um, have signed up to the United Nations Declaration on, on Gender Responsiveness. Uh, so the member states, uh, uh, so when we say member states, we mean the national standards bodies for, for, for uh, United Nations member states would have signed a declaration to say that they are um, actively um, uh, pursuing uh, gender equality and gender responsive standards initiatives. Uh, so this is the premise on which this, uh, this uh, presentation is set. And I'm gonna just describe a number of the, uh, just briefly because when we have a few minutes, uh, the internal working groups within the GRSI, the Gen Gender Responsive Standards Initiative, in the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, of which I'm the leader of one of the working groups. And this one is uh, on the network development end. And, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Uh, so first of all, in relation to the first working group within GRSI, it's, it's about knowledge sharing and training. So we're, we're actively trying to get the information out there in relation to gender responsiveness and, and uh, activities that are are promoting equality uh, and particularly gender equality uh, via the standards uh, networks. So the first part of, of the task for working group one is to, is to just collect resources related to gender awareness and gender training that is currently available through the national standards bodies of member uh, organizations. So uh, within Ireland, that would be the National Standards, standards Authority of Ireland. Within Britain, it would be uh, the British Standards Institute, and within Germany, it would be DIN, and in France, it would be AFNAR, etc. And the WG1 then is establishing a, a, a database uh, or a repository of available information that currently exists around uh, promoting uh, the, the, gender, uh, uh, the, the, the gender discussion. Uh, as part of, of establishing this repository, WG1 will, will conduct a four-part survey, and that's going to be sent out to the, the signatories to the, to the uh, gender uh, declaration. And the first part of that uh, survey has been worked on at the moment uh, within WG1. There was a meeting uh, last week about it. So hopefully um, it, uh, all our, all our uh, members will, will be a party to that and provide valuable insights onto where their organizations are in relation to uh, the, the education around gender responsive standards. The second working group is on the methodology around GSI. So it's about di di documents and, and generating documents about how to develop gender responsive standards. And one of the examples you mentioned there, uh, which is a classic one with seatbelts, you know, where the human anatomy, uh, the, the, the de facto default is, is you use a male anatomy when creating standardization related to, to uh, safety. And uh, this is something that, that we need to be cognizant of in relation to developing our, our standard, uh, standards across all disciplines, not just, I mean, my specialty will be in ICT, but not just in ICT, but in, in relation to um, uh, oil and gas and, 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 and automotive and all the other areas of standardization as well. We need to look at these standards as we develop them with a gender lens to see what well, our are, are we all equal in the eyes of the standard, you know, and, uh, and uh, to make sure that there isn't a specific uh, a gender inequality built into the standards process. So, so these guidance documents have been developed then by the methodology group um, on how to assess gender responsiveness as well as how to uh, develop gender responsive standards. And lastly, my group then, which is working group three is network development within GRSI. And we want to expand the network of, of signatories and national representatives you mentioned the, the gender focal point area earlier, and, and we can talk a little bit about that just at the end. National standards bodies are, have to be nominated by the UNESCO-GRSI ambassadors. And so in, within those standards bodies, if you want to uh, engage with G GRSI initiative in UNES, then you nominate a gender response, uh, sorry, you nominate an ambassador to, to UNES. 
Uh, and we want to go from a situation where we have people just signing up to the gender responsive um, uh, programs by saying, yes, we, we agree that we should be better and we need to uh, create equality and uh, particularly gender equality in relation to the standards we develop and how we conduct our business. But that's very easy to do just to sign a document. What we now have moved to is gender action plans. And we want people to undertake projects and initiatives which don't just say, I believe in the following, but they create action plans to, to create projects which have tangible outputs, which demonstrate that we are uh, gender responsive. And my working group then has, uh, is looking at the scope and target audience in, in relation to trying to do this, uh, expanding our links where, to uh, other organizations, not just through national standards bodies, but also to look at how we can engage with, with uh, other um, uh, international organizations and universities. Um, and specific gender related uh, initiatives like Women in AI and, and Athena Swan, for example. Um, and then most recently, what we've done is we've, we've promoted a gender session at the International Conference on Sustainable Development, where we, we, we uh, invited sp specific uh, uh, themed uh, articles we presented, uh, presentations we presented um, uh, from a gender perspective. And as I said, the gender focal points are, are being contacted at the moment um, from UNIS uh, to, to look at uh, the creation and, and the, uh, the filling out of these surveys from, from UNIS to USI so that we can look at how active they are in terms of their engagement with gender action plans uh, and uh, moving forward with that agenda. Um, and as, 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 as you mentioned earlier on, like most of my, my uh, involvement is, is with, with standards development organizations. So we do a lot of work with, 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 uh, with ISO and with IEEE, et cetera. And we have a, a, a gender um, uh, lens that we look at in all our standards development, uh, development now. So just as ISO and uh, SEN Senlec now look uh, towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals when they're developing their standards, we also have, um, uh, encourage them to look at, at, at the gender questions when they're talking about their developing their standards as well. And not just about the engagement, you know, in terms of having representatives like, like the previous speakers have, have shown the, the, the breakdown between a male and female representative at, at the working group level, at the editor level, at the convener level, etc. But also at the outputs from the consumer's perspective, you know, because, for example, in, in relation to SMEs and startups, you know, females uh, would have would be uh, far more active in terms of creating their own companies. So they need to be represented in terms of standardization. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the SME sector and the startup sector, um, they don't have the money to engage with international standards because it's an expensive pastime. And in the European Commission, one of my one of my roles is as the director for the European Observatory for ICT standards is to use European Commission money money to support engagement in international standardization where uh, obviously smaller medium enterprises and startups wouldn't have access to funds to do that. It's very time consuming and it's very costly. So hopefully that gives a, a little bit of background in relation to uh, some of the work that's going on in, in UNES. Uh, and also uh, uh, if I had more time, I could talk more about Standby CT and, and those European Commission initiatives. So thank you, um, Secretary General. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ray. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you, after the signing, it's not just stopping on this being a signatory, but you want even to reach out to universities, to other organizations. Uh, and the, uh, lastly, you even mentioned the impact on SMEs that we know currently <clears throat> women in those SMEs, all that they are too much at stake in the participation in the standard development. I would like to, to know uh, they, if you have a plan to engage more uh, the, the, the private standard organization, you know, many industries uh, and the SMEs actually are impacted not just on the, the international standard or other standard organization that are recognized by their countries, by their government, but they are also impacted on private standards that are on the market. Uh, do, do, you, I know you mentioned the methodology in developing the standard. Well, are you going to reach out to those ones too? 
Yes, I mean, part of the engagement uh, for the, the surveys is it, it was individual national bodies. So it's not, while they are, while, while United Nations is international and ISO is international and IEEE, the larger uh, organizations are international. We also look at regional, you know, we don't just look at, at international. Um, so within the United Nations, like, you know, we would, we would have regular um, discussions with uh, regional organizations. So ARSO could be could become point, part of that, you know, in terms of the regional representation in, in Africa could could speak uh, at, at the UNES meetings, you know, in terms of giving their input uh, as to what's happening on the ground within their different member states um, uh, on the continent of Africa. But we also do that uh, regionally with, with Europe as well, you know, to look at how Sensen, like an Etsy are, uh, what their priorities are in relation to their standardization ob objectives and how they're approaching gender responsiveness uh, in, in how they uh, develop standards and develop their work programs. But, but as you said, there's also uh, at a lower level, then we may have a uh, yeah, company st uh, developing standards as well. Not it wouldn't be national, uh, and there wouldn't be um, international standards, but it could be um, a de facto standards where uh, a a company develops a, a technology, and that technology becomes adopted and, be, and 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 gets some traction in the industry. Then those obviously those types of standards can become uh, uh, de jure standards as well o o over time if if they're if they're seen as being uh, of benefit to the, to to the international community. Uh, and we, and UNIS would 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 deal with individuals. With organisations, with regional uh, regional actors and international actors, there's no there's no one stop shop here. There isn't one specific type of of organisation or actor that UNES engages with. We're quite open and, and collaborative in, in what we do. And similarly, within within the say the Stand ICT program, um, it, which is a which is is uh, the power behind the European Observatory for ICT standards. They they operate on a an open and collaboration rather than duplication um, uh, methodology. So they like to collaborate with international organisations, with nation states, with individual companies. You know to foster um, uh, and improve uh, engagement with standardisation. Uh, and part of that obviously re revolves around having to get funding to do that because the, uh, our, our Stand ICT project, for example. Is a four million euro uh, in um, project uh, funded by the Horizon 2020 um, by the European Commission, and three million uh, so three million euro of that of that money is given directly out in grants to help uh, companies and and uh, organisations engage in international standardisation because it can be the cost can be prohibitive. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think our participants they can reach out to you uh, for more engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Thank you. Secretary. Our, our next speaker is Nathan Taylor, uh, who is the secretary of the ISO IEC Joint Advisory Group uh, on Gender Responsive Standards. Uh, Dr. Eve talked about um, this uh, Joint Advisor Group on Gender Responsive Standard. Uh, I would like to ask Nathan Taylor uh, to continue in this way and uh, uh, talk about the ISO perspective where the Gender Action Plan uh, are more. Uh, Nathan. Uh, Secretary General, uh, thank you. And uh, first of all, may I just uh, offer my apologies uh, for my tardiness. Somehow I had uh, I'd missed the, the time difference between uh, uh, between our time and, and East African time. Uh, may I share the screen, please, sir? Yes, please. You can share the screen. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, as uh, ju just just before I get started, uh, just a bit of background on myself. I joined ISO uh, two years ago and uh, had uh, previously uh, done a lot of uh, spent most of my previous career working in development um, and uh, and certainly the concept of uh, of gender mainstreaming is really central to a lot of uh, a lot of international development programs and I and. Uh, I think certainly um, looking at some rural development questions, but more recently I looked at questions around how gender and uh, and trade relate to one another. So uh, I, I do really appreciate. 
Nathan, yes, can sir. you change your display settings? Because we're looking at your, your um, uh, we, we don't see you in full screen. So just swap presentation. Exactly, perfect. That's the one. Okay, thank you. Um, so no, it, it's, uh, it's an honor to, um, to, uh, to, to present on the work that ISO and IEC are, uh, are doing in this space. I'll speak primarily from an ISO perspective, but just, uh, just certainly to recognize this, the JSEG that, uh, that I look after, it is a, uh, a joint group uh, under the uh, Technical Management Board of ISO and the IEC Council Board Task Force on Diversity. Uh, so I think um, Ev has kind of touched on this uh, in, um, previously, but just really to touch on the strategic goals of ISO towards 2030 and, and really the importance of, the, of having the diversity perspective, including gender uh, within, uh, within our standardization work. And then I think as well, really looking at um, looking at some of those broader issues of really, when we say delivering standards when the market needs them, I think really thinking about that our market uh, includes uh, women and men. So, so um, and, and I've touched on the, uh, the ISO 2019 to 21 gender action plan and the JSEG particularly works in area three, which is really focusing on our technical communities and particularly in terms of the content of standards. So there's, there, there's an issue around the representa um, representation of women and men on standardization co uh, committees. And then there's really the content of the standards themselves. And I uh, picked up on that in, uh, in some, of your, uh, some of the previous discussions here. So, and really as, as Ev had mentioned that our work in our current gender action plan is really establishing a baseline for forward action. So we will be leaning uh, in towards a new gender action plan 2022 to 2025, which will be much more action oriented. And, and a lot of the outcomes of the discussions we're having within the JSEG will find their way into that 2022 to 2025 gender action plan. So, so again, it's. Um, I think just in terms of how we've structured our mandate, and this has been uh, an interesting debate within the wider conversation of diversity and, 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 uh, and, and recognizing there's a number of different diversity considerations, but really in terms of the content of standards, we're really looking at a male-female uh, binary, although we certainly recognize that that is subject to uh, uh, to contestation, but again, this is really about how um, um, how the divergent needs of women and men are represented within the technical content of standards. Um, so, so what we're looking at really is having a looking at the procedure and the supporting guidelines that we could look at within the ISO IEC directives, uh, which govern the uh, uh, our standards development rules, where can we within that process uh, have uh, a procedure to assess gender, uh, gender implications and how to better sensitize our tactical communities on the importance of gender responsive standards. Um, so, so these are these are the five areas that we're primarily working on. So, for one, looking at what is the what is the procedure? What are the questions that we want our technical committees to be asking themselves around assessing the divergent impact of standards on women and men, uh, and then reflecting that how to use how to use data and how to gather and leverage gender responsive data or to encourage the seeking out of gender responsive data to make sure that in fact uh, what is what is being put in the standards in terms of technical content is is, is data driven. Um, and then I think really how do we how do we reach out to to the full range of our, our of our technical uh, community and I'll touch in a moment on a survey that we did in 2020, which kind of gives us a bit of a baseline of where the technical community's thinking is. Uh, and, uh, and, and really to provide some examples in case studies that 
will help to open the technical community's minds more to perhaps some of the less obvious examples less obvious but still very important uh, um, considerations for when we need to look at uh, when when we need to look at the divergent impacts of standards on uh, on men and women and to communicate and uh, and measure so I'll touch a little bit more on um, so so in keeping with um, um, with what I've mentioned earlier, that this is a definition that we're using within the context of, of, of our work. And I think it's really recognizing not only the fiscal differences, but also the socially constructed uh, gender roles and looking at both of those perspectives to see that, that standards are equally addressing uh, the needs of, of women and men. So again, this is really about the content uh, of the standards. Um, so in the five working groups that we've set up, the first group is really looking at, okay, what is that, what is that checklist? What is that procedure that we want to uh, encourage um, and perhaps in the future mandate our technical committees to carry out um, along with supporting case studies to illustrate the importance uh, and then looking at the question of, of data, and we've developed some guidance around uh, checking and finding gender responsive data. Um, looking at, and in the survey we did in 2020, we did find some best practices within our technical community. So we're looking to uh, delve deeper into those and to identify what's being done well within our community and to bring those best practices forward. And then finally, uh, developing our communications plan and how we want to how we want to measure change within our standards development process. Um, so in 2020, the questionnaire that we did, we sent this out to the entire ISO and IEC technical communities uh, and, and got quite a robust response, 356 responses. Uh, and really the core question was, are, 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 are you considering gender, why or why not? Um, the responses really point to really only a quarter uh, are actively considering gender and three quarters are not. And, and, and I think this really points to the, the challenge that, uh, that we face within this space in terms of sensitizing and socializing the importance of gender responsive standards within our communities because we have 79% saying that it has no relevance in our area. They, um, and I would say this response came more frequently, say from, uh, um, say from those committees who, who, who are developing products. Uh, and, uh, and they say, well, th th this, this is a gender neutral product or, um, uh, but, but I think what we're trying to further encourage the committees to do is to really think about how men and women may interact differently with that product or with the process or, uh, or with a service. Um, so I think what's, what's optimistic is we have almost, we have, uh, a good 40% that want to hear more. And we're in the process of kind of engaging and getting some of those best practices out. But I think just some of the, the, the case studies that we looked at, I found these really quite, in, quite interesting. So I think the, the PPE one was, was raised in, uh, in a previous discussion, but ones like voice recognition software, is, is the software more programmed to understand uh, if the software software is programmed with male voices, is it, can women interact with voice recognition software in the same way? Looking at say building ventilation standards and, uh, and, how, um, and how different standards interact with, um, how, um, how HVAC conditions interact differently with, with, with men and women. And again, this kind of information comes out when one is using um, uh, gender desegregated data. Um, looking at occupational health and safety, one of the case studies we looked at is there's gender divergences in the types of 
workplace accidents that happen, as well as the recoveries from those accidents. So are we looking, and again, using gender desegregated data, are we looking at uh, something like occupational health and safety with an appreciation of those differences? Or even if you look at service standards, when we looked at is consumer complaints, what are maybe some of the socially constructed gender roles that might result in a difference in how women and men would interact with, with that type of a service. So, so again, it's not so much the product could be, uh, could be viewed as, gender, as, as, as non-gendered, but it's the interactions. And that's really the message that we're trying to bring to our, to our tech, technical community so that we can really see, um, and it, it's, it's really asking some of those questions around how people interact with products, with processes, with services. Uh, to uh, to I to what I hope would really widen how the the portfolio of standards that we have that are gender responsive and that and that will be certainly one of the performance metrics that that we look at. So where we're going from here? So the five working groups we're consolidating our findings across those those five groups now, and then that will report to the. Uh, respective ISO and IEC boards. And then what our plan is, is with this report, we would release a guidance to the technical commu uh, community to really underscore the importance of gender res responsive standards, give some best practices and give, give some case studies and some thought pieces that would really encourage the community to think wider about the implications of, of, of gender responsive standards. So we'd have an initial guidance that we'd want to bring out to the community at the beginning of next year. And then some of the longer term uh, recommendations we'll have around uh, training uh, committee managers and chairs and perhaps looking at changes to the formal directives and to the formal submission documents that we use in ISO and IEC. Uh, and, and to see if once the community is more sensitized it, that to, bring, to, to formalize it even more within the process and have the supporting, uh, uh, supporting guidance and tools for our technical communities. Um, so, so yeah, it's, um, I think we're at the kind of at the end of our ground truthing and I think we're at the beginning of what I hope will be um, an exciting few years within the ISO gender action plan where I'm hoping to really see some action and some change within our technical communities. And um, thank you. And I turn the floor back to you, Secretary General. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Very, very interesting, a good program ahead. I, I am just asking myself, because we, we, we know standards are uh, science-based, science-formed, and uh, there are so many projects that even came under ARZO or other organization where you are asked, okay, you are requested to have this number or percentage of gender. Then when you ask a country for, for putting in the mirror committees, uh, we may balance the women male as what you are saying. Then they tell you, yeah, we don't have a female or in this subject, in this area. I would like to ask you, what is the component that maybe you are looking at in those working groups that link to common existing problem of inequality, and mainly in education that has been existing? How do you think this can be addressed if, if you, 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 we need really to have uh, gender responsive uh, standardization work? Well, and, and, and that, that's, uh, thank you, Secretary General. And, and I guess that's, you're, you're, you're raising a, a debate that's, that, that's challenged us. And, and, and I think in terms of the mandate that I, that, that I described, we've, We've really more focused on the on the standards development process, um, as opposed to so if you, if 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 you look at the entire ISO IEC directives, uh, what we're largely looking at is what's covered in what we'd call clause two. So that's that's the process. That is how you 
write up and define a new work item proposal, how it goes through the working draft, committee draft, inquiry, inquiry draft. Now, now, the other point you're raising in terms of the participation question, uh, that is, I would call that the clause one, that's kind of the constitution of technical committees, the, the constitution of working groups. And yes, an argument can be made uh, for, um, do we need to look at those clauses? So the mandate of the JSEG is really looking at the process clauses, but yes, you raise a point, do we need to look at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, at, at the clause one, do we need to say a working group shall be constituted in this way? And I guess, and, and, and I'll just return to the, to the ISO strategy to, to try to uh, answer some of that question. And I guess we're looking at, we're looking at the inclusivity and diversity question I'd say we're looking at it in that space, we're looking from, from a wider angle. So it's, yes, the, the participation question uh, around women and men is part of that diversity uh, priority there, but also in there, we're looking at youth, for example, how do we get more young people involved in standardization? How do we get more developing countries involved in, uh, in standardization? How do we get more, SMEs, how do we look at the stakeholder categories that we have in place now? So that's our academia, our government, uh, our uh, large business, small business, how we define our stakeholder groups now and how we say, okay, we need to work with these groups. We're asking ourselves the question, do we need to look at those stakeholder groups differently? And, and already, yeah, we have the projects on young professionals and standardization. So I think the, the answer in terms of the participation question, at least from our strategy, it's being looked at, gender is being looked at as part of a wider diversity mix. And that's really part of our long-term strategy. But I think the content of standards, uh, and uh, there's kind of more of an urgency in terms of the content of standards. Our, our process standards fit for purpose for women and men on an equal basis. That's a more urgent question that needs to kind of be addressed on its own. And that's what the JSEG is after. Now, uh, now ultimately, I think that question of our standards fit for purpose can go into a whole number of other diversity categories as well. And I think we'll see that. Uh, in the future in terms of, okay, do we want to set kind of rules around having more youth or more small businesses? So, um, so yeah, I think your, the participation question is a long-term diversity question, but what the JSEG is, it's that clause two stuff, it's how standards get, um, but obvious, but if you want, if you want gender to be considered in a technical committee, yeah, you need, to, you need to have women there, but as that process evolves, in the meantime, we need guidance for the people that are there now. And that's what we want to release at the beginning of 2022. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nathan. Thank you very much for your presentation you, and insight. That's why I am looking to uh, different work that all of us are undertaking in the standardization toward the fourth industrial revolution. How really this gender uh, mainstreaming will impact on those standards to come when you look at the robotic, yeah, artificial intelligence and so on. I look forward to next year's how the work will be going on. Thank you a lot. And this take us actually to our next speaker, uh, who is Nadia Hasham. Uh, she's a trade policy expert at uh, the Africa Trade Policy Center and uh, Economical Community for Africa. It probably will get some response there. Uh, once again, uh, she will be discussing with us the role of gender and sustainable development, uh, including the global governance on uh, trade. Uh, Nadia. Uh, you can share your, it's, it's okay, on your side. Uh, 
Hi, okay, now, now I can share it. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to join. I'm very pleased to be here and join uh, all these wonderful colleagues. I will just uh, share my screen. Okay, all right, uh, can you see it? Yes, I see it. Uh, you need to put on full screen. Yeah. Oh, it's. Uh... You can double click better? on it. Yes, that's okay. Now, thank you. And so you're not seeing the presenter view, correct? You're seeing the full screen. Yeah, we are seeing this right okay. now on full screen mode. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, great. So um, actually, it's, it's a good place uh, to start. I, I'd like to look at some of the lessons that we've learned from gender mainstreaming in the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement to see what we can learn for what, what this means for standardization in the African context going forward, looking at the, these, these areas of strategy structures and capacities. So um, I think we all know, you know, broadly the relationship between trade and gender, but what I wanted to, to highlight is that standards and access to information comes out frequently as barriers to trade for women. And um, we know that gender inequalities lead to reduced output and efficiencies. So it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a human rights imperative, but it's also um, part of the, the benefits of trade as well to, to look at this holistically. And in the absence of some of the data, you know, we do have data gaps here. Uh, we like to look at the roles that women play in trade. And this can be producers, consumers, workers, but some areas where women are overrepresented, uh, we've talked about already MSMEs in the informal sector, the unbanked. And so we can look at some of these, these angles to see how uh, to, to um, integrate some of the evidence we have. Um, now, the, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, we expect that it will provide new opportunities for women uh, in, in looking to participate in trade, um, and particularly of, of the SMEs and regional value chains and, and moving to higher value added activities, but also um, women who are involved in labor intensive industries with uh, lower skilled wages. Um, and so, so just to say that we, we you know we want to be able to address some of these barriers so that women can fully participate and and benefit holistically so what have we been looking at well at, at ECA we've been looking at the mainstreaming of gender in national and regional implementation strategies for the implementation of the free trade area agreement and we've sort of taken taken a dual approach which is that we've looked at mainstreaming gender and all the technical issues of trade, and at the same time, looking at targeted measures to support women's empowerment and gender equality. And uh, we've learned a great deal from going through this process of being able to, to look technically at, at the inequalities of how women and men experience differently these different issues, but at the same time, looking at what can we do to kind of target this in a targeted way to advance those areas that might be you know, access to finance or, or something like that. Um, and some of the, the what we've followed in terms of the steps is uh, looking at the data anal and analysis, and so doing that kind of gender analysis. And again, we find big data gaps here. So uh, in the absence of some of some of that data, we can look again at where women are overrepresented in some of these in some of these groups. Then also the importance of stakeholder consultations. And so how do we now access some of these groups where women are overrepresented, like cross-border traders associations, informal traders. Um, key sectors where women are uh, employed and making sure that those voices are coming into, into the consultations. So um, this is another area where, where, you know, that needs particular attention from a gender mainstreaming angle, and then identifying how these interventions link with existing policies. And so, it, you know, it's, it's great if we build the capacity of, you know, women to, to be able to, um, meet the standards in a given area, but if they don't have uh, land rights, for example, then it doesn't, maybe it doesn't really matter uh, in, in terms of if they can meet the standards for agriculture, agricultural products. 
Then um, at the same time, we're looking at improving institutional capacities for mainstreaming. So what does this mean? Well, this means we're also looking at ourselves. So we have a strategy for understanding how we also um, in supporting this process are able to look at the gender dimension of these various issues. Um, and this is not just us, we're also looking at the capacities of the various institutions involved in the development of, of these um, negotiations and, and programs. So this can be the regional economic communities um, at, at the continental level as well, at the national level as well. And so, a couple, so a couple overarching lessons that we've learned. One is that uh, complementary policies at the national and regional level are required. Um, and these are where we can actually look at the differential impacts of, of women and men to avoid these risks. So things like occupational segregation and, and gender wage gap. At the same time, um, the gender equitable agenda should be a central goal. And so we can build upon existing interventions. And I wanted to look at one uh, example here on um, a study that, that we did with you actually, <laughs> Uh, to look at what we can do in identifying priority products for value chains and standards harmonization. And I think th this is a really good example because, you know, um, the, the study looked at how to now uh, identify priority products. And here is a prime example of where we can look at, um, you know, uh, for example, if we're looking at goods that are existing, that are traded now, commonly traded goods, we may miss out on, for example, informal cross-border traders and goods that are traded informally because we don't have data on that. Or um, if we're looking at, um, we might also miss out on firms that are not yet able to meet standards and, and export. So we need to be able to, and, and those include, of course, women-owned firms and, and areas, uh, sectors where women dominate. So um, I think you know, we need to look at two things here. One is building upon existing successes at the regional level. And the other thing is looking at female dominated sectors um, in prioritization and what does that mean for, um, for in terms of the uh, gender um, at, that, at that level of those sectors. And, and this can be, you know, for example, some, some sectors that we've identified that are expected to gain from trade, for example, tea, textiles, uh, cotton for textiles, um, palm oil for agricultural inputs, uh, high return crops, um, and at the same time, looking at some of the sustainable development areas as well. So perhaps on traditional medicines or environmentally sustainable value chains or other areas where we're working with you um, and where women uh, are, can, can not, not only are, are, could be um, big players in, in the game, but right now, but could be in the future um, and could take a lead on some of these areas. And so if we look at the structures, and I'll go through this very, very briefly, um, in, on, on, our, on our business index, we see that small businesses score the infrastructure environment relatively poorly. And of course, this, this is, you know, overrepresented women. Um, and so we can look at, for, this is an example of, of co collaboration on quality infrastructure. And what I wanted to look here is that, is, is what I wanted to emphasize here is that we should look at the existing structures. Um, at the national level, we can look, as I said, at, at mainstreaming gender in the national plan. At the regional level, looking at the capacity there as well and the collaboration that exists there to, to advance some of these ideas. Um, at the continental level as well, of course, here we are. Um, and, and at the international level with, with some of the partners that, that are also here. Um, and now at the capacities, one thing that we've looked at here, and, I, and we talked about the role of the regional economic communities in implementing standards, one thing we've done here is to look at the capacity as well of the regional economic communities on the continent to mainstream gender um, in their work. And we've, we see that across the continent there's variation, um, but there's some successes as well. So we've seen um, some, some of them have focal points, um, some of them have policies often, and, um, and so we can, there's, there's areas where we can leverage. And so what we've come up with in terms of where the role is at the regional level on um, frameworks. So continental frameworks on trade and gender, on best practice, understanding best practice, um, on programs harmonizing and, and planning strategically for programs, especially those that include cross-border cross trade and making sure that gender is mainstreamed into those programs. Then consulting and linking with the appropriate network. And, and of course, as I mentioned already, data and analysis. And so, uh, 
cross-cutting would be stakeholder coordination and looking at you know, the time horizon for being able to build some of these capacities. Then of course, we want to make sure that they interact with existing measures that are supporting women in trade, like for example, simplified trade regimes that, that have shown to really, um, to really benefit women who are, who are trading at the cross-border level. At the same time, things like you mentioned quotas, for example, quotas for government procurement. Um, if women can't meet the standards uh, at the governmental level, then having a quota for government procurement for women-owned businesses doesn't do very much. And we find that that's actually a barrier um, that women are facing to participate in, in government uh, quotas for government procurement. Um, then we can also come down to the level of the capacity of the businesses themselves. And the, the free trade area and the annexes on uh, technical barriers to trade and sanitary and phytosanitary measures do make it easier to meet those requirements in the sense that it makes it predictable. And this also makes it uh, better for, for investment. So now there's a level of predictability for, for businesses um, looking for investors to say, we, we are meeting a, a continental standard here, um, but it should be complemented by the ease of those procedures as well. And so some, we find uh, documented some of these obstacles for women, the procedural barriers, the compliance itself, of course, and then obtaining the certificates. And um, technical assistance can, can, of course, support here. Um, but we also want to ensure that standards are included broadly in training and capacity build, building programs for participation in trade. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention on private sector participation, um, in the consultations for designing policies, we have to make sure that the private sector that is being consulted is inclusive. So we have to look at the various segments of the private sector, and we've already talked about those. Um, we have to look at the role of the business associations, which ones are we consulting um, in designing these policies and trying to make sure that our standards are, um, are gender sensitive. Um, and when we're designing training and capacity building, are we, are we actually able to reach the right stakeholders? Can we reach cross-border traders, for example? Um, so I, and, and then finally, involving women in, in leadership roles, which has been discussed already, the importance of that. And um, lastly, on the data capacities. So this is, again, something that I mentioned earlier, and I would like to come back to. The, you know, to be able to make evidence-based decisions, we need data. And the capacities for collecting this data uh, are often um, you know, not as comprehensive, particularly data that's difficult to collect on informal trade. But then we also have to figure out how to use this data. And this is, again, where we can look at the various levels of national, regional, continental, to, to look at how we can use better use statistics to uh, look at designing gender-sensitive uh, standards. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nadia. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Actually, uh, as has the standardization bodies organization have talked, and we know standards impact on trade. Yeah. And you have shown that women are overrepresented in SMEs, in informal sector, in low, low, very low end in the business and the trading capacity. And they are found at very low level in the value chain. It, 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 you heard what the standard people have been talking about today. What do we do wrong? Yeah, for you, you interacted with these traders. What can you tell us you, you do this wrongly and please change? Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that the the biggest concern that I've heard at the standards level is, you know, it, it's great to have a harmonization of standards um, because it creates some predictability, but then there is a concern that that creates actually an additional barrier to participating in trade for SMEs because they're not able to meet those standards. They don't have the capacity. And those who do, and that's those who know about the standards, then, then and, and those who we talk to, of course, about it, then their concern, especially as leadership of associations, is that their members actually don't know um, that the information is not easy to, to obtain um, and that it's very costly to, to try to do it on their own. And so the associations do have a role to play, but you know, um, it's not always clear and, and they need some technical guidance in being able to understand how they can support groups of members to be able to 
um, to meet these standards. Uh, and, and, but I think the primary concern is about is that it will exclude, um, exclude smaller businesses from being able to trade without uh, being able to meet those standards and that the larger businesses will move farther ahead. But you know, there's also the option for them to be able to integrate in value chains so it's not, you know, not necessary that that these businesses have to do it on their own. If they're if they're supplying larger businesses, sometimes that can also be or creating linkages with businesses, that can also be a way to um, un better understand the standards that are required and and have uh, some investment in the capacity to to meet those standards. Thank you, thank you very much. I I will come back to you for for your recommendation. I, uh, Nathan, the, there was a question on the chat uh, uh, asking um, uh, who can be a member of the ISO Gender Focal Point Network? Nathan or Eve can take it. So <clears throat> I'm gonna take it uh, SG. Uh, in terms of whom we're expecting to join the network, we're really looking at all levels, uh, SG, because we realize that, as Nathan said, it's not just a question of uh, development of standards per se, but if you looked at those, um, uh, the graphical representation that we showed you, clearly um, it cannot just be about developing standards or, or the people in the technical committee. I think this whole aspect of gender mainstreaming, I think Nadia, you also made a reference to this in your presentation. It really is a holistic approach. So really expecting that um, the network will attract um, the attention of at least um, you know, quite a number of different stakeholders who are interested enough to, to provide input uh, because there's so many different dimensions. As you heard, there's the trade dimension, there's the dimension of SG, um, SDGs, dimension of standards development, ETC, ETC. So um, I've just posted, I don't know if it's on the chat platform, a, a, a you know a video for you know for those who have time to listen to later on in terms of the expectation of ISO. Yeah, it, it will be shared. Thank you. Mm. Uh, Why do you have uh, the, the the mic? Uh, can, which I don't see any further question from the participant. What, what is your takeaway recommendation? Just one takeaway recommendation. Okay, um, I think listening to all the presentations uh, from the beginning up to now, uh, the first aspect is that I'm happy we started having this discussion in the first instance, because I think for most of us, it may not have been uh, a particularly, um, you know, topical issue at all. But I think as things are unfolding, we're now realizing that there's need for us. So I think the take, the take for me is really to say, how can we mainstream gender in everything that we do so that we don't look at gender as an afterthought, but rather something that we build in from the beginning right until the end of our uh, you know, uh, standard development processes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ray, uh, what would be your takeaway message? One, one takeaway message. Thanks, Secretary General. Um, yes, I think basically for me, uh, a lot done, more to do. Um, we have really just started the process of of equality and, and gender equality within standardization. Uh, we have a lot of, um, I think, committed people right across the world who, who are great supporters of, of uh, gender responsive standards, um, who support the UN SDGs and in, in, in SDG 5 in, in particular, and are looking to, to uh, create global change in this regard. Um, but we need more action, we need, need more projects where there are tangible outputs that demonstrate gender equality and then demonstrate gender responsiveness as part of their activity, rather than it's too easy for us to say, yes, I support uh, all gender initiatives and um, you know, leave it at that and, and there's no follow through. So what, what, what I, I'd like to see uh, is, is um, 
um, not just the standards development organizations, but organizations, you know, multinational company, multinational com companies, you know, SMEs and startups actually actively engaging in gender issues, supporting gender issues and uh, looking to do their small bit, like by making sure that when they're hiring, that they're 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 looking for for uh, gender equality in, in hiring of staff, in promoting their staff to leadership positions, you know, where uh, as as Eva showed earlier in, in, in terms of the the um, uh, the leadership positions within the standards of open organizations like editors and conveners etc and not well represented but and it's not that that uh, that um, uh, the, the there isn't talented people out there that can do it they need to be supported in doing it and uh, uh, that's my takeaway message is a uh, lot done more to do thank you thank you Ray uh, Nathan what would be your takeaway message Nathan? Thank, uh, thank you, Secretary General. Um, I, I think I think really my takeaway message is 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 is, is the importance of the data and uh, and and I think and it's particularly when we're looking at. Um, if we, some of the some of the specific, say, physical characteristics we look at, grip strength, for example, I think really to have to to have the intuition to look at, at gender disaggregated data, and I'll just I'll reflect on uh, one of um, uh, on Nadia's uh, presentation as well around uh, around women-owned businesses. Um, one of the questions we grappled quite recently with in, uh, in ISO, and it was um, an initiative from one, one of our members, is actually defining what is a woman-owned business. Is there a standardized definition for a woman-owned business? Because kind of everything else would, everything else flows from there. Um, so I'll mention we, we did just publish what we call an international workshop agreement uh, number 34, kind of get giving a set of consensus-based definitions on what constitutes a woman-owned business. So, and and yeah, if with with the definition, then you can have the data. But and I think I think the other reflection is that, um, and and I think reflecting on on Ray's comment that this is a long process. And if I maybe compare it to my time working in development, where concepts like women in development, these came out in the 80s, it's still quite new in the standardization world. And I look at that picture of the first ISO meeting in 1947, and it's 47 white guys in suits. And, and it's nice to see how much our community has evolved to this point. But as Ray said, I think there's still a lot more to go. And from the ISO and IEC side, I'm certainly excited to say that we will start to get some concrete products and deliverables showing up into next year. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Secretary General. Thank you very much. Yeah, no more those guys in Suteron. Yeah. <laughs> Nadia, what is your takeaway? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I like the, the point on data that, that Nathan made. And I actually should point out that in our own research, uh, there's not even a common definition of SMEs or MSMEs uh, across uh, most African countries. So that's already a challenging place to start, even if we're trying to use that data now to infer what does this mean for women. So, um, so I think that that's, that's a, a good point. And, and we are working on, on that as well. Um, but, but I also will say that, you know, as Ray said, it's a long process. We, we were just starting, but there's a lot that we can learn from what's been done in, in other areas and other sectors and industries on how to do this. And that's why I brought the example of what we've done at, at the national level, at the level of national policy and continental and regional policy, because I think we can, we can tap into how gender has been mainstreamed in, in other areas. Uh, to, um, to, to advance this one, to advance the issue of standards. And then also to, to advancing gender in this area can support the larger agenda on, on the continent of, of uh, equitable and inclusive growth um, through, through standards. So, so that's also uh, an exciting uh, place to be for, for this area of work, I think. And thank you for inviting me to, to participate in it. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I got at least five key points that we should go with. 
uh, one being uh, uh, the gender responsive uh, procedure that should be there uh, in the standardization on the procedure at least uh, for now. Uh, secondly, really we should look at the gender uh, from the beginning in whatever we do. Uh, third, uh, the, the all of us being multinationals or SMEs that we should uh, have uh, a gender lens. Uh, we, the other point is uh, the number four, the priority sector of standardization uh, that should look at in the areas where actually we have more intake of women. And the last point, importance of the data. Yeah, there's uh, gender desegregated data. That is very, very, very important. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to thank our uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Ev Gazikwa, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Ray Walsh, thank you for being with us. Uh, Nathan, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, Nadia, thank you very much for being with us. And all of you, I see my good friends from all over Asia, Turkey, and uh, actually some South American. Uh, who attended this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, our next webinar uh, will be next month on another exciting topic, uh, which will be on uh, uh, quality policy issues. Uh, the African Union have approved the Africa quality policy, and uh, we will be discussing this uh, quality policy uh, on 30th November, 2021. Um, I call once upon you kindly to join our webinar uh, next month, 30th November, 2021. Thank you very much and um, have a good day and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye.